Robert Charles Brown, serving time for rape and murder in Colorado, made headlines once again in July 2006 when he claimed to have killed 48 other people, which, if true, would make him America's most prolific known serial killer. However, there were skeptics. When his total proved to surpass by one the record set a couple of years before by Green River killer Gary Ridgway, Brown's confession provoked skepticism. Was he telling the truth? or just seeking attention by one-upping the current king of the hill. The truth can be difficult to establish, especially given the events that led up to his unexpected revelation. In 1995, Brown pleaded guilty to the 1991 murder in Colorado of 13-year-old Heather Dawn Church. Five years later, he initiated a correspondence of cryptic notes to Texas prosecutors that suggested more victims. The score is you won, the other team, 48. He dropped a few clues, but seemed to want them to figure it out. A cold case squad got involved, and eventually Brown declared he'd been killing since 1970 in nine different states. On a crude map, he showed 17 in Louisiana, 9 in Colorado, 7 in Texas, 5 in Arkansas, 3 in Mississippi, 2 in New Mexico, 2 in Oklahoma, 2 in California, and 1 in Washington State. He'd used a knife, a screwdriver, an ice pick, and just his hands. He dumped victims everywhere, in lakes, rivers, and gullies. Some he'd even cut up. Even so, confessing and corroborating one's claims are two different things. And if Brown is exaggerating, he wouldn't be the first. Claiming higher numbers of victims, especially from prison, has become a regular pastime for serial killers since the late 1980s. To consider the motives Brown might have for such exaggerated claims, we need to lay out a bit of history, both his and that of prison culture. It began with the disappearance of young Heather Dawn Church. While evidently not Brown's first victim, this was the one that stopped him. Mike and Diane Church moved to a remote piece of property outside Colorado Springs in Ebert, Colorado. A person would have had to have gone well out of his way to find their home and abduct one of their children. So it seems fairly clear at once this was a local crime. Heather, 13, was one of four siblings, and she enjoyed playing outside. Responsible and studious, she gave her parents no cause to worry. She was even enrolled in a program for gifted students. Eventually, Mike and Diane separated, and Mike moved into an apartment. That left Diane alone with the kids at the remote homestead, but she said she did not feel unsafe there. Nevertheless, when the separation came to look like divorce, the house went on the market. Her neighbor up the road was Robert Charles Brown, 38, living in a trailer with his fifth wife on property used for a tree nursery. Diane didn't know them, but apparently Brown had grown aware of her, or at least of her home. On September 17, 1991, Diane's world caved in. She had taken two of her boys to a Boy Scout meeting that evening at the local Mormon church, leaving Heather to babysit her five-year-old brother. Diane called at 8.30 p.m. to make sure everything was okay, meaning to tell Heather to close a window in the master bedroom she'd seen open, but she forgot. When Diane returned after the meeting, she noticed that the house was dark and a sliding door unlocked. At first, these details didn't alarm her, but to her shock, Heather was not in her room or anywhere else in the house. Diane called every one of whom she could think, including Mike, but no one knew where the girl could be. She called the sheriff's office, and someone came right over, but a search and rescue crew could not be sent out until daylight. The crew combed through the woods and knocked at every neighbor's door. Diane remembered the open window in the master bedroom. They examined the window's bent screen, which appeared to have been forced and a latent fingerprint examiner dusted for prints. She managed to identify and lift a good one, so that if they found the person who'd bent the frame, they could make a match. Searchers came onto Brown's property, and, while he was helpful, he refused access to a specific building, saying it was securely locked. They accepted that. The authorities believed they were looking for a wandering child, not a potential kidnap victim, and Brown seemed quiet and unassuming, just another neighbor. There was no reason to suspect him. Many people were questioned, and the lifted print was sent to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, 
as well as to the FBI, but no match turned up from their computer databases of convicted offenders. At the time, though, this type of search was limited. The databases from all the states had not yet been hooked into the automated fingerprint identification system, so if a match had come in from another state, the chance of identifying him with this print was low. Heather wasn't found in the initial searches, and it was two years before someone chanced across her remains. Along Lower Rampart Range Road, where other homicide victims had been recovered from time to time, a scrap metal collector found a human skull. The still-intact set of teeth identified it at once as the remains of Heather Dawn Church. Her body had been dumped about 30 miles from her home. The hope for her safe return one day had been dashed for good. To identify the perpetrator of this crime, the difficulty lay in gathering evidence. Two years after the kidnapping, retrieving a skull from among a heap of junk meant there would be little, if anything, in the way of trace evidence. By this time, many men had been questioned as suspects, including Mike Church. Fathers are always initial suspects in the abduction of a child, especially during a period of separation, but no one had been implicated. America's Most Wanted had devoted part of an episode to the case without producing fruitful leads. Yet even the discovery that the girl had been killed and her body dumped nearby failed to advance the investigation, so the case went cold. In 1995, Lou Smith, who would later become famous as an independent investigator in the John Bennett Ramsey case, was a captain of the county's detective force. He set to work on the case file, creating a timeline and looking for possible clues that others had missed. He re-interviewed certain people and looked at the burglaries in the area at the time. He also checked and rechecked alibis. It was painstaking work, but he was known for his persistence. This was often the way a good detective broke cases that others had given up as a lost cause. A lab worker suggested rerunning the lone fingerprint. It was always possible that the perpetrator had been picked up for another offense and his print was now in the automated system. Some cold case cops ran unmatched prints every day for years on the hope that finally, on this day, the perpetrator had been arrested on some other charge. This kind of dogged devotion had paid off several times, helping to generate more interest in other cold cases. Smith made up a package with a blown-up image of the print to send out to 52 jurisdictions. Two months later, in March, he received good news from Louisiana, a match to a man convicted for burglary and car theft in that state. The man they were looking for lived within half a mile of the churches, Robert Charles Brown. It was disheartening to have been that close to the perpetrator, even to have searched his property, and yet to have missed him. But nonetheless, he was still there. Despite his protests of innocence, detectives brought Brown in for questioning. First, they wanted to know if he'd ever done work on the church's home, to eliminate this possible reason why his fingerprint would be at the scene. He denied it. When he learned about their evidence, he insisted they run the print again. He was certain it was a mistake. But the print was good, and it was his. At his arraignment, he pleaded not guilty. The investigators had little else, and they knew a case for kidnap and murder would be difficult to make, but they got to work looking into his background. To their surprise, two months later, Brown changed his plea to guilty. According to his story, he had entered the home through a window, and Heather had surprised him. He strangled her there in the house and took her body out to dump it in a remote location. For this murder, he received life in prison. Smith believed Brown had made this unexpected admission because investigators were looking into the disappearance of another woman. She'd been his neighbor in Louisiana, and, if extradited to face trial for her death, he could face the death penalty. Since he was now behind bars, there seemed little reason to continue to investigate, especially outside their jurisdiction. It was Brown himself who revived interest, but five years later. Once more, it took the work of cold case detectives to open it up. Many cold case squads were formed during the 1990s as a result of a drop in the number of violent crimes. Since 1960, as the U.S. murder rate had steadily risen, police departments had added personnel. The increase in violent crime was accompanied by a higher percentage of stranger homicides, the most difficult to solve and the most demanding of resources. It seemed that things would only get worse, but in the middle of the 1990s, the murder rate declined. 
Police departments now had surplus resources, and they could return to older cases to give them more attention. With dramatic new developments in forensic science and technology, especially DNA analysis and more extensive computer databases, the solution to some cold cases looked imminent. A new breed of detectives trained in these scientific resources and technologies took to the field and began working out how to put these advances to work for investigative purposes. They also cared a lot about solving these older crimes. Over the past decade, the cold case units around the country had cleared hundreds of backlogged cases, putting offenders behind bars who'd believed they'd escaped detection. In addition, many innocent people who did not belong in prison were exonerated and freed. But these investigators can't take on every cold case. To prioritize, case selection involves consideration of various solvable factors, former witnesses ready to talk, a new suspect, or new technology not tried before. Key evidence must be preserved and available for testing. Biological evidence can be tested for DNA profiles, and fingerprints can be entered into databases that receive more new prints every day. Cold case detectives have access to the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime, the U.S. Marshals Service, military investigative services, organized groups of retired professionals, and crime investigation volunteer groups that offer unique services. The science of cold cases involves more than just the latest technologies available for solving older, unsolved cases. It's also about historic incidents and inventions that have helped to develop specific areas of a relevant discipline, like ballistics or toxicology, or have gained ground in court for an increasingly sophisticated approach to crime investigation. Among these cold case squads was the one in the Colorado Springs area that focused on Brown. Lou Smith, now retired, Charlie Hess, former FBI and CIA, and Scott Fisher, a crime photographer and retired publisher. They were dubbed the Apple Dumpling Gang. Smid and Hess met weekly to discuss unsolved crime, and Hess took up correspondences with convicted felons to see if he could get more out of them. One of them was Charles Robert Brown, but only after Brown had already reached out. In 2000, Brown began dropping hints. He sent a letter to El Paso County prosecutors, writing, The score is U1, the other team 48. This seemed to have been inspired by the Zodiac messages in which an unknown killer in San Francisco in the late 1960s taunted police with his score versus theirs. Among other things, Brown also wrote, Seven sacred virgins, entombed side by side, those less worthy, are scattered wide. If you were to drive to the end zone in a white Trans Am, the score could be 9 to 48. That would complete your home court sphere. Again, it sounds like he was reading a book about the Zodiac and trying to copy his style. Smith was already aware that two women were missing from Brown's hometown of Cushada, Louisiana, both from an apartment complex where he had worked as a handyman. Hess began correspondence and he and Brown played a cat-and-mouse game for about four years before the effort paid off, but only after promises and a few gifts. They were finally able to solve the murder of young Rocio Sperry, only 15. Detectives set to work on The Grand Am Lady. Hess got Brown to provide more details, including that the woman had been an army wife who had once lived in Florida. From her, he'd taken a specific type of ring which he described, he also pinpointed the apartment complex and said that the victim had lived at either Unit 107, 108, or 109. They got a list of Pontiac Grand Ams and Trans Ams registered in Colorado between January 1987 and December 1988. There were 172. This was further narrowed down until they located a Grand Am owner named Joseph Sperry. He had lived near Pikes Peak during the right time period. He'd served in the Army and his apartment number was correct, 109. His wife at the time had vanished in November 1987. Her name was Rocio, and she'd had a ring like Brown had described. Joe had been away, and upon his return, he found her gone and her clothes piled into garbage bags. A ten-inch length of her hair, cut off while still in a ponytail, lay on a dresser. And while his television was gone, her purse was still there. He called the police, but became an immediate suspect. It was he, not the police, who found the car abandoned, but he could not get them to process it. Unfortunately, 
A clerk had mistakenly written that Rossio had been found, so the evidence had been tossed. That made corroboration difficult, but most of the circumstances matched what Brown had finally described. Once the victim was identified, although her body was never found, he pleaded guilty and received a second life sentence. Of the 48 supposed murders, Brown had provided information in 19, and even with those, much of his accounts were vague. He had been considered a viable suspect in only seven more, but in these, he would provided solid details. Of the nine supposed victims in Colorado, he'd supplied information in only two cases. The first person he said he had killed was male, a soldier in South Korea in 1970. That case could not be verified. There were several unsolved homicides in the areas Brown claimed as his killing ground, and many families hoped for closure about their missing or murdered loved ones. Detectives in different jurisdictions investigated their case files to try to determine if Brown could be their man. They understood he might have read news accounts about their victims and could then report names, dates, and other items to falsely link him, if he so chose. They knew well enough to be careful not to feed him more. One potential victim was Catherine Jean Hayes, whose remains had been discovered in Wynn Parish, Louisiana, in 1981, six months after she disappeared from a restaurant. Another woman, Wanda Hudson, had been murdered in 1983 in her apartment, where Brown had worked as a handyman. He said he'd attacked her with a screwdriver. Faye Self had gone missing from the same apartment complex in 1983. Brown claimed he killed her in her apartment and then took her body out to the Red River, dumping it. He made the same claim about another woman from Louisiana, unnamed because the authorities were unable to corroborate it. Brown's details were too vague. The same was reported about a few other cases that Brown claimed. During interviews, he was unable to give sufficient detail to assist significantly. More than one officer expressed reservations about Brown's grandiose claims, but Brown frequently clammed up and refused to say any more. He was the one in the driver's seat. Brown wrote a letter in 2002 in which he hinted that he might have kidnapped someone to hold her in a concealed chamber, but then he had been incarcerated. Since he could not get to her to feed her, she presumably died. Would he then be held responsible? If so, then three should be added to the nine. He followed this with a letter the year after in which he stated he did not know why he was writing these letters. I'm trying to get my affairs in order, he wrote. To do so, I need to contact many sources of which I don't even know who they are. He mentioned that the sanitation companies do a great job of disposal and claimed that no one ever got away, never gave the opportunity. If you're going to do it, just do it. He stated that he found women untrustworthy and that what generally triggered a murder was disgust with a person. He viewed women as cheating whores and users, although it was never made clear why he had taken such a dim view. As months passed without much progress, many people began to question whether Brown was the killer he claimed, or more of a con man. It would seem to defy reason to confess to something one did not do, especially murder. But some ambitions override reason. Notoriety, for example, gamesmanship, leverage for better conditions, and even self-aggrandizement. Let's consider similar cases. H. H. Holmes was convicted in Philadelphia in 1896 for an insurance fraud that involved murder. He insisted he was innocent, but for $10,000, proclaimed himself the world's most notorious killer, claiming 100 victims before reducing that number to 27. The newspaper wanted a sensation, he whined, and before mounting the gallows, he paired his confession to only two. The truth was probably somewhere in between. During the 1980s, coverage of serial killers became its own industry, inspiring groupies, wannabes, and entrepreneurs who created trading cards and sold serial killer memorabilia. Serial killers became cultural anti-heroes. In a wound culture, where people openly displayed their physical and psychological scars on talk shows, some serial killers were cast as the ultimate and traumatized children lashing back, and many were willing to play this to the hilt. For television cameras, these killers spoke about their lack of self-esteem, their abuse, and their unrestrained compulsions to erase the lives of others in order to feel alive themselves.
After killing a 10-year-old child, Donald Leroy Evans, 34, a self-described white supremacist, confessed to more than 60 murders in several different states since 1977. He was finally convicted of only two murders, and he recanted his extravagant confession. Donald Harvey, a male nurse, claimed over 80 murders before making plea deals in 37 of the cases. And when the police arrested Glenn Rogers in 1995 in connection with five murders, he took credit for 70, including those of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. Then, he said he was only joking. He was convicted in two. Pee Wee Gaskins told his story to an author, claiming that he'd killed more than 100 people, mostly women. And while he was certainly prolific, many of these murders were unverified by the time he was executed. Claudine Eggers, 78, became pen pal to Joseph Fisher in prison for the murder of a 16-year-old boy. He was paroled in 1978 and moved in with Eggers in her New York home. She financed his cross-country trip on which he killed several people, including her. But after being caught, he pursued the distinction of being the most notorious serial killer. Initially, he said he had decided on 26, but had accomplished only 19. Various murders from around the country were attributed to him, and soon his total went over 30. However, he was only tried for the murder of Eggers, for which he was convicted of second-degree murder. He then granted interviews to the media, including tabloid-style talk shows, and soon his claimed victim total was up to 150. He thrived on the notoriety. Many believed him, but it would not be long before another killer made law enforcement officers realize how easily they could be duped. The most infamous confessor was Henry Lee Lucas, arrested in 1983. This one-eyed drifter estimated he'd killed 100 people but eventually raised that number to 360 in 27 different states. In an unprecedented event, lawmen filled an auditorium in the hope of closing their open cases. But then, Lucas recanted. No one knew quite what to make of a killer confessing to so many crimes he did not do, but then he insisted that he'd been forced to recant. His persistent waffling reduced his credibility. While it was clear that he had committed four murders, including his mother, even one of those, a female victim dubbed Orange Socks, came into doubt. Some criminologists believed he was responsible for between 40 to 50 murders, but no one knows for sure. But we do know that during his confessions, Lucas got extra special treatment, nice meals, a comfortable cell, and plenty of attention. He was having a ball. I set out to break and corrupt any law enforcement officer I could get. Lucas said later. I think I did a pretty good job. He received the death penalty for orange socks, but this sentence was commuted to life and he eventually died in prison in 2001 of natural causes. The truth, if it remained anywhere, went with him. Dr. Stephen Egger, Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of Houston Clear Lake and the author of The Killers Among Us, An Examination of Serial Murder and Its Investigation, once interviewed Lucas. He experienced firsthand the challenge of interpreting such confessions. It was difficult to tell when Lucas was lying, Edgar admits. In some cases, I might ask him to talk about an average killing, and it seemed to me that what he said came from his imagination. He just thought it up. He was convicted of 11 homicides, so he was a serial killer, but he did blow a lot of what I call smoke and mirrors and played a lot of games. Edgar advocates verifying whatever serial killers say, one case at a time. Most of them are psychopaths, and they're good at lying. I don't place a lot of stock in my interviews with them. It appears that Brown might have studied Lucas as well as the Zodiac. None of these men had any remorse for their murders or their lies. They're not made for it. Among the most dangerous features of psychopathy are a callous disregard for the rights of others and a propensity for violating norms. They might not necessarily become outright criminals, let alone killers, but the likelihood of exploitive and deceptive behavior is high. Without remorse, psychopaths charm and manipulate others for their own gain. They lack a sense of responsibility, and they con others with no regard for the feelings of others. In fact, they don't see others as fully human as themselves.
Those with low inhibitions against violence may kill. Psychopaths are suffering from a personality disorder, not a mental illness, that involves traits such as narcissism, impulsivity, and callousness. From brain scan studies, it appears that they fail to process the emotional content of situations such as empathy, concern, or alarm. Those who commit crimes have proven more brutal than other criminals, more aggressive, and more diverse in their activities. They also represent a high percentage of repeat offenders. They're resistant to therapy and intolerant of frustration. It doesn't matter whom they hurt. What matters is that they get what they can for themselves. Because they don't have what people need for living in social harmony, some psychologists refer to them as unfinished souls. Robert R. Hare, a renowned expert on the disorder and author of Without Conscience, says there are indications that the personality structure and propensity for unethical behavior is shared by both criminal and non-criminal psychopaths, and they may be as common as one in every hundred people. Psychopathy, Hare believes, touches virtually every one of us. For the most part, when they do offend, their crimes are cold-blooded. With those who are serial killers, there appears to be a strong tendency towards sadism. They find victims easily because they're glib, charming, and predatory, while their victims are generally naive. They dispense with anyone without a thought for the suffering of either the victim or their families. Thus, there's no reason to believe that they'll tell the truth whether under oath or not. It's not easy to know when to trust someone who has already exploited trust as a route to torture, rape, and murder. Psychopathic killers knew their victims as objects, useful only as pawns in their own personal game. And they thus have this advantage, they feel no remorse. They're callous, manipulative, and resistant to therapy, and when they choose to communicate, they have their own agendas, formed in self-interest and calculation. What we may accept as a confession, they may view as bait. Their motives take shape within a framework that has no equivalent in the normal world. That's why we can't just accept what they say at face value. A special agent from the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit interviewed Gary Ridgway, who had initially confessed to 71 before settling on the official toll of 48. She had this to say, I can't think of any behavior on its own merit that would indicate that someone is telling the truth or exaggerating. It's not that I wouldn't believe them, but I'd like to get basic verification first. In my opinion, many of these people have an egotistical need to control and manipulate, and some like to be bigger and badder than the other guy. She points out that not only might they lie to exaggerate or dupe investigators, but paradoxically, they might also conceal murders they committed. They don't want anyone to know about their early, feeble, halting attempts or the mistakes they made. If they lose a potential victim, they claim they intended to. It's hazardous to be gullible, especially for investigators hoping to close a case. They might inadvertently reveal details, allowing offenders to play them for fools. As well, they may expend limited resources. However, there are hazards in dismissing these offenders, too, notably that they may stop providing details that can solve crimes. The bottom line is this. Even skilled investigators may not spot a clever liar with a selfish agenda. Detecting deception takes time, patience, a bit of sleuthing, and the corroboration of facts. Above all, it requires the ability to avoid a rush to judgment that may result in mistakes, such as those made with Lucas. While psychopaths appear to use the same language as normal individuals, they have their own inner logic. They calculate the world around them in terms of self-gain. They are society's vampires. They may be intoxicated rather than repulsed by the idea of targeting humans and picking them off because it makes them feel powerful. Their agendas have no analogs in the normal world. That means developing a careful mode of communication in this person's perception, almost any response could be the wrong one. Former FBI profilers John Douglas and Greg McCrary have conducted prison interviews with psychopaths such as John Wayne Gacy, who killed 33 young men and buried them under his house, and Mark Hoffman, a brilliant forger who tried to escape debt by killing people with bombs.
These criminals have no sense of the damage they've caused. To urge them to express regret is pointless. They might do so, but only as a manipulative tactic. There are three important things to keep in mind when talking with psychopaths. Clear goals, firm boundaries, and awareness of their triggers. In other words, keep your purpose in such communications up front while also watching for the psychopath's manipulative tactics, charm, deception, deal-making, and for what will keep him, or her, talking as opposed to shutting down. It's tricky, and getting it right generally requires extensive exposure to the person. No matter how many letters Hess or others write to a killer like Brown, only those who have lived with them on a daily basis know him well, and even they can be fooled. Brown was the son of a sheriff's deputy and brother to a former state trooper. His was a family that cared about public safety and the law. However, Brown developed differently. He was the youngest of nine children in Cushada, Louisiana, dropping out of high school to go into the army. In 1976, he was dishonorably discharged for using drugs. If he's telling the truth about one of his murders, he used a position as handyman at an apartment complex owned by his brother to kill at least one of the tenants. He had no shame or sense of family loyalty. The fourth of his five ex-wives, Rita Morgan, gave an interview to the Charlotte Observer, providing details about the kind of man Brown is. For one thing, he often flew into rages and made frightening threats. He would tell her how easy it would be to kill her with no one the wiser. Yet when he had wooed her before they were married, he'd been compassionate, even doting. This behavior is called compartmentalization, something psychopaths are good at. They morph into whatever they need to be to gain their ends. And once they have it, they let their true personalities show. Before, he held the car door open for her, wrote one reporter about Rita. After, he smashed her to the floor for a misplaced set of keys. Most of his marriages lasted three years or less, and several wives alleged abuse. Rita said she'd had no inkling of what Brown might be like. They met when he was on leave from the service, and she was just a teenager. They took up a brief correspondence, and when they encountered each other a few years later, she had married and divorced another man. He began to show up where she worked as a waitress, and finally, they went out. He came with flowers. They got married, and within a week, Brown had become a bully. He was already yelling at her that he could kill her. She was stunned. But then he apologized and assured her this behavior would not be repeated. He lied. Almost anything could set him off, and he seemed to go into a trance before he started beating her. He believed he could treat his wife like property. He once put a gun to her head and pulled the trigger, but the gun was unloaded. He also choked her once so badly she had to go to the hospital. But once he asked her to shoot him, as if he knew he was bad and he wanted someone to kill him. He said he knew he had a problem, but when she got him to a clinic, a psychiatrist was so confrontational it ended any hope she had of intervention. Brown was furious. Another woman with whom Brown was involved said he enjoyed thinking of himself as a master, with her the slave, and that he watched a lot of pornography. His final wife filed for divorce and went into therapy for victimization issues she was reportedly afraid of him. A year after Brown's startling confession, a reporter for the Shreveport Times decided to check in on what was happening with the investigation. While authorities were reviewing the claims he'd made, several deputies had expressed disappointment. Investigators in four states had dropped their investigations altogether or ruled Brown out as a viable suspect. In Washington, investigators had searched in vain for evidence of a woman killed at a scenic overlook between Spokane and Seattle. While three murders in Louisiana appeared to match details Brown provided, he'd not been charged. In fact, as of July 2007, no new charges had been filed since those for the murder of Rossio Sperry. One promising case involves Nydia Mendoza, who was murdered in 1984. She was a dancer in Houston, Texas, and was seen leaving one night with three men. Her body was found four days later. The case went cold until Brown's confession. He described a young woman like Nidia and apparently provided details that had not been made public. At the time, 
he'd been driving a white van to make silk flower deliveries. He claimed to have accompanied her from the club, taken her to a motel for sex, and strangled her. He then supposedly dismembered and beheaded her, taking the parts away in a suitcase. He dumped them off a highway exactly where they were found. He might be good for half a dozen murders, perhaps even the nine he'd once suggested, but that's as far as authorities have come in making a case. In many ways, it doesn't matter. He's in prison for life. But it does matter to the families who want to know that the person who killed their loved one has been caught and is being punished. Hess declines to say whether Brown opened up because he wants to clear his conscience. It's a common belief that the guilty suffer and need to get their guilt off their chests. That's not true, however, for psychopath. Brown grants information, it seems, when there's something to be gained, medical treatment or a possible transfer. Despite his attempt to barter information for a different prison, he will most likely serve out his sentence in Colorado State Penitentiary. It's unlikely that he'll ever be known as the most prolific serial killer in America. His claim to fame is receding quickly.